Welcome to this anthropology lecture, lecture 22, on women's health. And I want to present to you uh, an argument for thinking about the status of women in world history through the attention paid to healthcare concerns for women. It would be one way we might measure uh, the, the place that women hold in a society by looking at the extent to which their health and care needs are met uh, by the society. So let's take a look first at the status of women around the world and then compare that to ancient Egypt. Globally, the world displays a lot of variation, and so you would expect to see different treatment for women and different attention to women's health care in different countries. In the overall perspective, that is looking at all the data around the world, we see that um, as, as of 2017, about 808 women die every day as a consequence related to pregnancy. So for the case of women's health, Clearly, there are dangers still in the 21st century for women as a result of getting pregnant. Some places have better access to maternal health care than others. And so depending on where we are talking, the, the danger associated with um, having a baby could be quite high. We know that no matter where women are located in the world, access to reproductive health care is particularly poor if a woman has a low income. And this could be any kind of reproductive health care. So it could be just routine health care concerns related to your reproductive system and not necessarily just for pregnancy. So women's access to birth control women's access to prenatal care, uh, women's access uh, to uh, health care related to illnesses that they might experience. Um, all of those are, you know, problems, especially for low income women in the U.S. as well as around the world, uh, which is not surprising that money might open doors for people. That's not really a surprising conclusion. And that some people might be able to buy better access to healthcare than others. There's also an issue globally that's a political one. Um, and it's an aspect of US foreign policy that often doesn't get talked about. It's called the global gag rule. The United States prohibits funds in the U.S. to any global organization that addresses what are considered to be controversial health care issues. Um, and we normally think of one such as abortion, which is controversial inside the United States. But this global gag rule also limits HIV, malaria, tuberculosis, and other funding especially since many of the same organizations that might um, help women's health care might also deal with global illnesses like HIV, a sexually transmitted disease. And because of this U.S. global gag rule, uh, the status of women's uh, reproductive health around the world tends to go down under Republican administrations when the gag rule is instituted. And typically in democratic administrations, the gag rule will be lifted. It speaks also to a very important controversy in the United States itself, our ongoing debate about women's access to uh, the choice of abortion, how to uh, regulate that politically, constitutionally, and so if you paid any attention over the last few years about Planned Parenthood and court cases dealing with this issue, 
you know it's not just a global problem or a global discussion, it's also one that occurs inside the United States. Another issue that we could take a look at besides women's reproductive health would be physical and sexual violence associated with relationships. Globally, about 35% of women have experienced some sort of physical or sexual abuse or violence of some kind in the relationships that they um, have. And it may be that women report these incidents more um, than men do. We know that men do experience physical and sexual violence, uh, but women far more so than men do. And it may be because the relative status of women puts them in a position whereby globally, and maybe even the United States in particular, men feel like they have access to women's bodies. We've of course seen this debate inside the United States over the last um, 10 years, the rise of the Me Too movement, the high profile cases involving sexual uh, violence against women on college campuses, the Brock Turner case, all of these are part of our ongoing social discussion about uh, the status of women's health in terms of being able to be free from the, the uh, intentions of mostly men who see access to women's bodies as a right um, that they possess. We could also take a look at the general issues of health uh, for women. Um, leading causes of women's uh, death would be things like heart disease, Alzheimer's, cancer. Um, heart disease sometimes presents a little bit differently in women. Um, and a lot of times people think of heart disease as a man's problem, but women do experience um, heart failure and um, experience coronary artery disease. Um, cancer would be uh, one where we would also see some attention in the last few years. If you've ever paid attention to campaigns to raise funds for breast cancer, um, buying pink products, for example, um, you would note that socially uh, the, the, the drive to address this issue is less controversial than say addressing violence against women or women's reproductive health. What about the case of ancient Egypt? Did the ancient Egyptians hold different attitudes towards women's health than men's health? Did women experience the kinds of um, medical problems, social problems in terms of their health that men did? How does that differ from modern women? Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of evidence to answer all of these questions well, but we do have some tantalizing clues that let us have a little bit of a window into how women are treated in ancient Egypt. For example, we have quite a number of medical papyri. So documents written on papyrus um, that chronicle addressing women's healthcare and healthcare in general. So papyrus Evers, Cahun, and Berlin would be examples. Uh, many of these papyri deal in general healthcare, uh, but we do have papyri that deal specifically in women's health, gynecological papyri. And typically what you'll see in uh, a papyrus devoted towards um, medicine will be a doctor mentioned, uh, the Egyptian word for that is sunu, and the doctor is instructed first to examine the patient. Step two in the papyrus will be a diagnosis. I, the doctor, have examined the patient. I now diagnose X, Y, or Z. And then the third uh, part of the papyrus will recommend some sort of treatment. T 
take some medicine, take these ingredients and put them together and it will solve this problem. Um, which honestly, that is the exact same setup that we still use today. Um, you examine a patient, you take in data, you make a diagnosis and you recommend treatment. Um, so the Egyptians um, are very different from modern medicine in terms of the overall approach. However, there is a difference um, in the way Egyptians might explain illnesses. Um, they do recognize uh, that the body has problems and it breaks down. They recognize that there are tumors and tears and all kinds of other problems, but they do document non-medical causes of illness. Demons, for example, might be afflicting a person. Um, ghost sex, it is actually a phenomenon um, that uh, being, you know, uh, the victim of a ghost, a spirit traveling around and having intercourse with you can cause problems, which is certainly something that uh, people in the United States would not uh, necessarily ascribe to today. Though maybe in some, some circumstances, you might have non-medical causes of illness, even today. Egyptian doctors did specialize, so it wasn't just that you're a doctor and that's all you did. We have evidence that doctors um, attained a specialty level in, in treating certain diseases so we see doctors labeled as uh, doctors for eye issues, doctors for uh, teeth, doctors for the stomach. Um, and we see pretty specific diagnoses for what we think are what we think are modern illnesses that we would recognize. For example, uh, we have treatments for cancer of the uterus mentioned in some papyri. We have evidence of a possible female physician, a woman, a fifth dynasty woman, um, Peshaset, um, who, who's noted to be a supervisor of doctors. Uh, we don't exactly have enough evidence to know exactly what she did um, or what that would have looked like, but presumably, there were training opportunities for doctors, especially training schools attached to the king's house, since the king would get the best medical care possible. Um, and these training schools um, would offer the opportunity for people, maybe even women, to attain some basic training in how to treat illness. So what can we say overall? Well, the Egyptians, as much as they are primitive in their understanding of disease, do have some similarities to the way we treat patients today, the way we specialize today. Um, though they did believe in non-medical, non-scientific causes for illness. Here's an example of a papyrus. Uh, that you would see. This is the Edwin Smith Medical Papyrus. Um, you can see it's not written in hieroglyphs uh, because, of course, that would be time consuming and take forever. Uh, so if you will remember much earlier, we talked about phases of the Egyptian language and that the Egyptians created a shorthand for writing much more rapidly. Here's another example of a papyrus. You can see this one's badly damaged, though not as badly damaged as some that I've seen. Um, it's got holes in it, um, painstakingly put together by people who spend years of their lives trying to understand these documents. Paprologist is the name uh, for that person um, who, who works with papyri. And we have quite a few of them uh, from the ancient world. We have some that have been carbonized um, from volcanic eruptions and that uh, scholars are working out and unfolding and unrolling and try to read. We have ones that are in pieces like this that uh, scholars try to put together. 
This could be your life's work um, dealing with these kinds of documents, if you were interested. Um, this is the Chester Beatty papyrus. The Egyptians did have a uh, nomenclature, names for body parts, which should tell us that they understood the human anatomy um, to a certain degree. Um, and in fact, um, they understood interior human anatomy to a certain degree as well, perhaps through accidents, um, of people, perhaps through uh, surgical interventions, um, things learned in war when victims had been cut open. Uh, so that might have gotten them this knowledge. And so you can see here they have named the body parts. These are the hieroglyphs for them. Um, the, the womb, the uterus, the mother of mankind, Mut Remet, or Hemet. Um, and you can see, interestingly enough here, we've got even a shape um, that mimics uh, the ovaries. So the little curved um, horns and then a long protuberance. Um, the cervix is, is named the, the mouth, Ren Hemet, the mouth of the uterus. Um, the vaginal opening or youth or cot, um, the further down opening is named shed, named for the baby, unu or suhet, um, which literally just means egg. Um, umbilicus has a name, so clearly there is quite a, a a wealth of knowledge just by their ability to like name the anatomy parts. Um, and if I showed you for a man, um, you would see the same naming here. Um, but since this lecture is about women's health, I'm not gonna do men's health. Um, interestingly enough, there is a determinative. You remember a determinative is a sign that helps to determine the meaning of a word. Um, and the Egyptians do have a determinative for penis. It looks like a penis, um, but uterus does not get a determinative. So they don't have a separate symbol um, that does that. Um, and that might imply something about them in terms of their thinking that men need a determinative, but women do not. Um, it's worth considering um, if that implies some kind of difference in status or if it's just an accident of, of maybe our understanding of the, the Egyptian language. Um, there's a possibility that there's another sign that's it's a, it's a sort of like a bucket that would hold water that the Egyptians may have used, um, but it's not entirely clear that that is a separate, that could be read as a separate determinative for uterus. One of my favorite determinatives ever is the determinative for birth because it features a woman with a child coming out. Um, Mesut is birth. And so here the woman is and the baby is coming out. Yay, touchdown. It looks like the baby has got his arms up. Almost like an upside down ka symbol. The Egyptians, of course, understood reproduction um, and understood the nature of what happens to a woman's body, what happens with men. Um, they knew that, for example, that, that men produce seminal fluid and that is very powerful. In fact, one of the creation myths of the world suggests that's how the world was created. Uh, when the god Atum um, created it from his own seminal fluid without anybody else. Um, as far as women goes, um, 
it is hard to know in women if there was a practice of separating women during their menstrual cycle. But that's a common occurrence around the world in many cultures. Um, these so-called separation periods for women were based in many ancient beliefs that menstrual blood is sacred, taboo, and dangerous. Um, and, and all three of those at once, that it is literally so powerful um, that women need to separate themselves uh, for an extended time until they're pure enough to return back to the home. Um, and of course, you can see why that idea may have arisen when you consider that, uh, you know, it would be pretty remarkable to note that a woman could bleed and not die uh, once a month. You know, what kind of power, what kind of magic is that? Uh, that men don't do that. They don't have the capability of doing that, but women do. Um, in ancient Egypt, um, menstruation or hesmen was identified largely with the Nile flood, potent metaphor there. Um, and there was a belief that menstrual blood could be used to cure illnesses. Uh, so for example, there's a, a treatment for sagging breasts that uses menstrual blood. Interestingly enough, the ancient Egyptians had no word for virgin. So virginity was not a concept for them that particularly mattered. But once a woman did become pregnant, i.e. lost her virginity, they did have tests for determining uh, whether she was pregnant and um, what the sex of the child would be. And we actually started the year with uh, a reference to this in one of the lectures. Um, one of the most common fertility tests is peeing on barley, um, which turns out modern tests on this show that it does work uh, to the extent that it can show um, pregnancy is there. It can't show the actual sex of the child, which the Egyptians believed they could determine that. Um, another test that women could turn to was to put an onion in your youth. You'll have to look back a couple of slides to remember what that is. And then if the scent came out of your mouth, um, then you were pregnant. The Egyptians were aware of contraceptives um, and the possibility of abortion, but children were highly desired. Um, and with life being short for many Egyptians, you know, between 30 and 40 for ordinary people, the pharaohs and kings and queens could live much longer. Um, with life being short, there was a value placed on having children. And so, you know, contraceptives and abortion were not likely very common. Most of them involved placing some combination of elements inside a woman's youth. Uh, dates, honey, carob, which is kind of, uh, tastes like a little bit like chocolate, um, acacia wood, crocodile dung, fermented vegetables uh, could all be placed inside and uh, possibly inhibit um, pregnancy. Um, we do know in the case of some of these items here um, that they do release chemicals that might be spermicidal in nature, um, like the fermented veggies, for example. Um, but it's not very likely that crocodile dung in your youth is going to um, is going to prevent a childbirth. Uh, it's probably just going to give you an infection. But then again, that infection itself might trigger possibly a body responding to an illness and then end the pregnancy or prevent contraception. So in a roundabout way, um, it may have accomplished the goal. Egyptian doctors apparently stayed away from the birth process. So this was an area in which Egyptian medicine seemed to have no clear role. Birth was uh, largely 
handled by women and helping other women. And they often did this in a specialized area separate from the household where a expectant mother would sit on a stool and then squat over a special set of birth bricks in order to give birth to the child, which you might think that seems very uncomfortable, but in fact, it's really smart because you'd be using gravity to help pull the child out uh, by sitting in this squatting position. And so in fact, it's actually really smart uh, that the Egyptians figured out this would be a way to do uh, birth, to at least help the birth process. Um, the Egyptians were aware that things could go wrong, and so we see in the medical papyri treatment uh, for the aftermath of birth for women, um, there were tears and other kinds of problems that could happen. Um, and so doctors could be called in uh, for the afterbirth part of what went on. Here's the village of Deir el Medina, um, reconstructed sort of uh, to show you what it would have looked like. Look how close knit everything is. It's kind of hard to see that from just a, a shot of the overarching archaeological remains. It's a very tight knit community. And it is from this community that we have our evidence of possible separate locations for women during menstruation. Um, this is a piece of evidence from Daryl Medina, year nine, fourth month of inundation, day 13, day that the eight women came outside to the place of women. What's the place of women? When they were menstruating. They got as far as the back of the house, the three walls, and then, of course, we don't know what's in the middle. Year nine, fourth month, the day when the eight women came to the place of women when they were menstruating, they got as far as the rear of the house, three guard posts. So very similar text, in fact. Um, same structure, um, but slightly different. And of course, also the gap, making it hard to know exactly what's going on. Is this a reference to a separate menstruation hut? Not entirely sure, but it's possible. Um, we know that those exist around the world in lots of different locations. Here's a picture of a menstruation hut. So notice it's a separate area for the woman to go to outside of the home until she can be ritually pure enough to go back into the house. When a woman was giving birth, um, three deities, two pictured here, uh, were invoked to help her. Um, Tauret is a hippopotamus goddess. You might think, why in the world would you have a hippopotamus assisting you with birth? Hippopotami are, are fierce mothers. They're very protective of their young. And so what better an image to have uh, to protect your young. Another one is Bez, uh, the, the um, dwarf god here that um, is a fat man with rather ample uh, breasts who really served as a household protective deity. Um, to frighten off demonic spirits and evil, chase away evil with his ugly and, and you know, frightening appearance. And so um, Bess is invoked for all kinds of protection in the home, but especially at the time of birth to keep away demons that might harm the child. Our third goddess is Meshkenet. Um, who assisted um, in the process of birth. Note here, we have an actual birth brick, one of very few birth bricks that uh, was found, and you can see it's the goddess, just shown as, just like here. Um, and so women would squat over these in order to deliver their children. What can we say overall about ancient Egyptian women and health? Well, one, Obviously, there's great attention paid to it. The value of women um, birthing children meant that Egyptian doctors paid close attention to women's health care issues. Women were valued. 
whether women had better um, or equal access to health care is going to vary with your status. Poor women probably did not have as great an access to health care as elite women did, as we might expect. Um, and even the mighty of them all, the king, the pharaoh, could fall victim to poor health. And we've seen that, for example, when we talked about Hatshepsut, Hatshepsut um, who died of cancer at about age 50. So overall, it seems that the Egyptians um, had a great esteem for women's health, though it's hard for us to answer any of the other questions about violence toward women. But we'll see um, with love poetry that women are certainly valued um, in terms of their contributions to love. And so I invite you to stick around for the next um, time we take a look at these questions when we look at love in ancient Egypt.